begin. Okay. Perfect. Great. Yes, there we go. Um, well, as we've already heard, um, John Gorham was an ambitious fellow um, for the firm uh, that his father had started. And um, my task today is to talk about the history of the design, and especially the designers, um, that John, first John Gorham and then his successors brought to the company to create the wonderful objects that are upstairs. Um, and the, the, what seems to be the, the norm at the company was to hire European trained designers uh, who perhaps because they were seen as more sophisticated or more in touch with the larger artistic developments uh, that were taking place in Europe, uh, Gorham had a tradition of hiring, uh, as I said, European trained designers beginning in 1857. Um, and one reporter observed in 1868 uh, speaking of Gorham, they have brought from foreign lands artisans and artists to exercise and what is of much more importance to communicate their skill and knowledge in the United States. Um, however, at the very beginning when, when John Gorham uh, in the firm of Gorham and Thurber set out to make hollowware, they actually went to New York City um, for an unidentified uh, silversmith uh, to make the drawings and wax models for their first um, uh, exercise in hollowware, which was this Chinese patterned uh, tea and coffee service, um, the one that you see in the exhibition upstairs. Uh, this silversmith may have been an associate of Michael Gibney, who had been supplying flatware uh, to Gorham since the mid-1840s from New York City. And this pattern was called the old Chinese pattern down the, in, in later years, it was referred to as the old Chinese pattern. It stayed in production for a long time at Gorham. And it featured the pear-shaped bodies, uh, naturalistic uh, cast ornament, and the lavish uh, repousse and chaste ornament on it that were common to tea and coffee services made all up and down the eastern seaboard, such as the tea kettle on stand on the right, which was marked by Augustus Rogers of Boston at about the same time. But as we've already heard, um, the, the real style change at, at Gorham took place um, with the arrival of George Wilkinson in 1857. Uh, he was born in England. Um, he had studied at the Birmingham Society of Artists in the 1830s and then was apprenticed to a local silversmith and subsequently worked for a couple of firms in, in Birmingham, which of course was a major silver producing uh, center in, in Britain. Um, and as we've already heard, he came to the United States to work first for the Ames Manufacturing Company, but, but joined Gorham a few years later. And uh, Wilkinson basically brought with him a knowledge of contemporary uh, silver design in England, which was this, uh, what today is known as neo-Grec uh, style, um, based on classical models and a wash in all kinds of allegorical and classical based ornament. Uh, this object uh, on the screen is the Union Vase, which was commissioned by the silversmiths and jewelers Bailey and Company of Philadelphia in 1864 um, to, as a donation to the Great Central Fair, which was one of these fairs that was held to raise funds uh, to aid sick and wounded soldiers, northern soldiers in the Civil War. And if anyone knows where this is, please let me know after the lecture, because we would love to find it, <laughs> since it has such a great Philadelphia connection. But um, I think you can see in the slide here how it's based on a Roman tripod form with a sort of Greek-style kylix uh, vase on, on top. Um, and then all kinds of personifications of liberty and war and various uh, trophies. Um, and a critic for a journal at the time hailed this as the finest and most elaborate specimen of fine art in silver that has ever been made in an American workshop. The 19th century loved hyperbole in its, in its <laughs> journalism, so. Um, but I think you can see when we compare it to something like this, which is the centerpiece from the Pompeian d dessert service made by Elkington and Company in England. It was designed by their, one of their staff designers, Auguste Adolphe Willems, um, who is a French emigre to Britain. You can see that they're very much talking the same language, the same kind of classical 
forms and um, allegorical personifications. This service was exhibited at the 1862 uh, International Expo Exhibition in London. So both Gorham and um, uh, Wilkinson would have seen it there. What was the impact of this on the firm's larger, uh, more routine productions? We can see in these two pieces from the service made in 1866 for presentation to Cyrus Field. Um, again, they're, they're based on Greek and Roman, for, loosely based on Greek and Roman forms with all kinds of elements lifted like the Antimian that you see between the legs of the stand on the uh, hot water kettle, um, and of course, medalli cameo medallions, which in this case are portraits of Cyrus Field. Um, the other thing about the neo grec style are these sort of exaggerated profiles where the handles and the, the flaring rims stretch out into, uh, direction, out into the atmosphere. And um, these, are, of course, are a really striking contrast to the Rococo revival that Gorham began with in 1850. Uh, it, there's almost no repasse work here at all. It's really about sort of smooth surfaces with small areas of chased ornament with a lot of cast decoration. So it's a, it's a different style. And there was a comment made in an article in Harper's in 1868 uh, talking about the advance that they felt Gorham had made uh, in the later 1860s, which reads, 10 years ago, the Providence makers dared not produce their best, dared not abandon the old forms endeared to the public by habit and protected by fashion. Many a time they were obliged to modify or lay aside a fine design only because the taste of the public was not up to it. It was too simple, too violent a departure from established patterns, or else it was chased beyond the market. At present, they find the public taste responsive to their own. Um, but it's worth noting that, again, this is something that's grounded very much in European precedent. Um, and you can see the same sort of flaring elements, the same kind of uh, base to the hot water kettle, the presence of classical decoration. And here you see friezes on the pieces as well as little cherubs um, on the base of the hot water kettle on this um, tea and coffee service that was exhibited at the 1862 London Exhibition by Christoffel of Paris. And this brings up actually the subject of the design library at Gorham, um, which Elizabeth has already talked about. Um, on his second trip to uh, Europe in 1860, uh, John Gorham records buying a number of books in both London and Paris. And I suspect that the copy of Owen Jones's Grammar of Ornament, which was published in 1856, was almost certainly among the books he purchased from its publisher, Day and Son, in September 1860. And uh, a book of models by Christoffel was actually recorded in the design library in 1871. So they were very aware, uh, both the people that were able to travel to Europe and the people working in Providence were very aware of what was happening abroad. So, um, as part of this European travel, both Gorham and Wilkinson made trips to see the um, International Exposition in Paris in 1867. And at this, at this time, they possibly recruited Thomas Pearpoint as a designer. Um, he comes to Providence in the fall of 1869. Uh, Pearpoint was the son and brother of silversmiths. Um, the family firm was William Pearpoint and Sons. Um, there are several contemporary sources that say he served as an apprenticeship in Paris. Um, I haven't been able to actually document that, but he is known to have worked with the French silversmith Leonard Morel Ladoy, who worked in England as a designer of exhibition pieces for Elkington and Company. So perhaps if he wasn't actually in Paris, he was working with a Paris trained silversmith. And Pearpoint subsequently worked as a designer and chaser in London for several silversmiths, including Lambert and Rawlings and Harry Emanuel. And you see here a cup that he designed for Harry Emanuel that was exhibited at the 1867 Paris exhibition. And you can see in the text, 
accompanying it that it was modeled in Rod and Repousse by the excellent artist Thomas Pearpoint. So he had achieved quite a reputation um, in uh, Europe before he comes to Gorham in 1869. And I think you can see that after Pearpoint's arrival, uh, classical figural decoration and relief ornament increased dramatically, both in quantity and their overall scale, uh, particularly in the Ferber, something that's evident in the Ferber service. Um, these are both pieces that uh, are known to have been designed, the, at least the relief work on them was designed by Pearpoint. Um, the Cellini vase um, of 1874-75 and the, and the picture here of 1874. And you can see where, where Pearpoint is coming out of the sculptural tradition of French silver of this period. Um, when we compare the Cellini vase to this one by Maturin Moreau and Michel Auguste Madru, made for Christoffel, um, the Education of Achilles vase, now in the Musée d'Orsay in Paris, uh, which was also shown at the 1867 uh, Paris exhibition. So it's something that Pearpoint would have, would have seen. You can see it has the same kind of ovoid body with these flaring um, handles and the same kind of large-scale central relief, which in the case of the Cellini vase shows a, a, a you know, scantily clad nymph leaning on a harp surrounded by little putti. And the, the, the sort of European character of, of uh, Wilkinson and Pearpoint's designs is particularly evident in the Century Vase, which they jointly designed for the Philadelphia Centennial Exposition in 1876. Um, it was over four feet high and weighed uh, over 2,000 ounces of silver, not including the marble pl or granite plinth, rather, that's incorporated into it. Um, it's at the center of it is a is an actual vase that's again in that kind of neo greek manner with these flaring um, sort of handle ends on it, but it's pretty much buried under all of the classical figural ornament um, embodying everything from Native Americans and buckskin pioneers at the base up to America triumphing over all the other continents um, at the top. Um, and Charles Venable has already pointed out that the, there's a close relationship, again, between this and European precedents, like Morel Ladoy's Helicon vase that was designed for the 1872 International Exposition in London um, and is now in the Royal Collection. As we've already heard, another uh, European trained designer who joined Gorham at this time um, which was in the early 1870s, uh, is Florentin Antoine Heller, um, who was French, uh, apparently studied briefly at the Ecole des Beaux-Arts in Paris, um, and came uh, to the United States in 1872 to work at Tiffany and Company, and then joined Gorham the following year. And Heller also had a piece um, in the Centennial Exhibition, The American Shield, um, where you see, again, classical personifications of liberty and freedom um, and the same kind of figural classical ornament that we've seen in other um, work by Pearpoint and Willems. Of course, um, Heller had firsthand knowledge of all of this coming from, from Paris, and it's the same, you'll see that even at the Centennial Exhibition, there were pieces exhibited by Elkington uh, designed by Auguste Adolphe Willems, the Medusa Shield, uh, which you see at the back of this photograph, that are strikingly similar to the work that um, is being done at Gorham. Um, and I'm bringing up all of this sort of indebtedness to European design because even in 1876, critics were saying that this was kind of tired and over, um, and that, um, that the, the, the time for this sort of thing had passed. And part of this is that the um, literature of design reform from Britain had already begun to permeate uh, by Ruskin and Morris and the progenitors of the arts and crafts movement. And of course, the centennial, as we've uh, already seen this slide, was the watershed for the moment when Japanese art appears in the United States. Um, and the, the later 1870s and early 1880s are a period both at Gorham in particular in the United States at large where um, 
the Japanese, Japanese art becomes an obsession in part because it responds so well to the principles of arts and crafts design. And a review of the Centennial Exhibition commented on the Japanese exhibit and said, it is filled in every part with a rich and valuable display, the variety and beauty of which are one of the great surprises of the exhibition. Gorham had actually been already making objects in, with Japanese ornament before the centennial, um, but they, it takes off like a shot after that. And Elizabeth's already talked about uh, the volumes of Hokusai's manga that were recorded in the design library. And I just show you um, this one page where they've lit, I don't think this is necessarily a one-to-one, -one, but the, the motif of a swooping heron is, that you see in Hokusai is also appears on one of the butter pats from the Ferber service, clearly inspired by Japanese sources like this. Uh, of course, English silversmiths like Elkington and company were also using uh, Japanese designs like this at this point. And in fact, it's in some cases a little difficult to know whether the ornament is directly coming from Japanese sources or it's being filtered through the, the British sources. But um, it's impress these are objects made before the centennial. So the tea caddy on the left, which is recorded in, in one of those wonderful photo books, um, in 1873, um, or the kettle on the right, which is in the exhibition in 1871, are very early essays in America of silver in the, the Japanese style. And of course, the shapes are much more simplified uh, than we saw in either the Rococo revival or the neo grec uh, style. And the ornament is very restricted on these objects to in these early essays. Um, and uh, I think in, in very much uh, lift, just motifs that are lifted, I think, out of prints um, or other sources like that. What's interesting to me is that we haven't been able to connect any designers' names at Gorham to the beginnings of this Japanese work. Um, and I, certainly Wilkinson must have been sympathetic to it um, because it, it flourished, as we know and we'll see. Um, but at the same time, his name is never connected to it. And Pearpoint actually um, published a series of articles uh, on artwork in silver in 1879 and 80, and actually never mentions Japan. He basically goes from Egypt to the present day. So apparently, it was not his style. And he actually leaves Gorham at the end of the 1870s. So his moment had passed. This is everybody's favorite piece. <laughs> Mine do. Um, and what, what they begin to do as, as the 1870s wear on is they're increasingly inspired by examples of Japanese metalwork that are exported to and exhibited in the West, many of which were not made of silver but were made of bronze, iron, and other alloys. And they were ornamented with patinated and textured surfaces and applied ornament, high relief ornament. And these pieces at Gorham are imitating that rich surface treatment and the, the appliques in a, in a simpler way. Again, as, as we've heard, they're a manufacturer, they're trying to make money, so they're, they're trying to do this in a way that's cost efficient. But I think in examples like this um, are just absolutely spectacularly successful um, treatments of the Japanese aesthetic, both in terms of the shape and simplified form of the object and in the way its surface and its ornament are treated. Um, I just wanted to show, you've already seen the vase on the left, which is the one here at RISD, the one on the right at the Met. Um, I know it, it, it's interesting to see how the hammering on the same model is different. Um, on the one on the, the left, um, I'm, I'm intuiting that they're trying to make it look like basket work because the shape is actually taken from an Ikebana basket form, um, whereas on the right, it's the more typical um, spot hammering that we're, we're used to seeing on these objects. So it's interesting that on the same form where even the placement of the mounts is kind of uh, set by design, that there were these variations in, in how they were realized. And of course, these, these objects were tremendously popular, as you know. I mean, there are multiple examples of, of, of many of these forms, as you can see here. 
Um, and Americans were very eager to claim these works as uniquely American. Um, they were, they were, it's partly because um, America did not have the guild restrictions, the United States did not have the guild restrictions that forbade the combining of different metals on a precious metal object so that you could put brass or copper or even infuse brass or copper into silver, which was not something that was possible in Britain. Um, but it's also that I think people even abroad recognize that these were very innovative objects at their time. And one wonderful uh, passage that was in the Jeweler Circular in 1877, a critic commented approvingly on objects that were made, quote, in tones too subdued and delicate to yield a motive to the ordinary purchaser. This trait is especially characteristic of the mature refinement of Japanese art, into the spirit of which our leading silver artists have drunk deeply of late, if one may judge by the prevalence of Japanese style in the novelties pouring forth from the restless laboratories of Gorham and Tiffany. We have seen a tea caddy from the Gorham works close enough to the slumberous oriental antiquity of tone to seem like some Japanese heirloom. Despite this reference to the prevalence of Japanese style, Japanese style objects were only part of Gorham's production in the 1870s and 1880s. It may be our personal favorite, or at least many of our personal favorite, but it wasn't all they were doing. Um, one line that well, remained consistently popular uh, beginning in the 18, late 70s uh, was hollowware with all over floral chasing, like the tea and coffee service that you see in the foreground of this uh, plate from an 1880 Gorham catalog. Um, and the text noted that this service was selected as an example of repousse. To this department, we have been giving particular attention. And having largely increased its working force, we are producing unquestionably the most desirable line of repousse work in hollowware and smallwares, which the trade demands. And in fact, Japanese objects um, made as the 1880s progress start to show the same kind of all over repoussé decoration rather than the textured backgrounds with appliques. Um, so that it's kind of a shift in taste in general. Um, here you see a picture uh, that, as Elizabeth has shown, um, the uh, design of the, the waves in particular is directly indebted to the prints of, of art, Japanese artists like Hokusai. Um, but it's worth noting that the Japanese style popularity peaked um, in the early 1880s and then slowly declines, or I should say just gets superseded um, by other styles that come in, uh, referencing various other cultural traditions. Um, and in the interest of time today, I'm not going to go into each and every one of them because um, each and every one, like this coffee pot based on a Near Eastern model, um, is, a, is a fascinating subject, but as I said, there's only so much time. I, I did want to mention that there are a few objects in this kind of pure English aesthetic style, which of course was what had inspired these, these changes from the neo grec to begin with, um, that I think uh, are, was not very not a style that was very popular at Gorham, partly because it was just overshadowed by the Japanese style. Um, but this vase is a wonderful example of, of English aesthetic uh, design based on the very simple kinds of forms that we can associate with Christopher Dresser's uh, metalwork. And of course, the use of cloisonne enamel as an ornament on this. Uh, comes out of dressers, designs of bilateral symmetry and all that sort of thing. Um, but it also comes out of uh, things like Thomas Jekyll's pavilion at the Philadelphia Centennial, where you can see the railing at the base has the same row of stylized uh, sunflowers. This is cast iron um, and still survives in Britain, actually. Um, there are other examples of English aesthetic designers work uh, influencing work at Gorham, a plate from uh, uh, Walter Crane's The Baby's Opera of 1877 and a plate made in 1878. Okay, now for something completely different. Uh, 
the Atalanta Prize Cup made in 1887. So in the later 1880s, as the Gilded Age sort of gathers full force, um, these kind of eclectic historicist uh, pieces again re become very popular. This was a prize cup for a steam yacht. It's probably designed by Antoine Heller. Um, it certainly shows all the hallmarks of this kind of uh, academic uh, historicist style where they've taken the best from the past, various epochs of the past, and combined it into something new. Uh, so you have a kind of looking at Baroque auricular style silver. You have all these classical motifs of the Nereids and Neptune up at the top, the flaring silhouettes again from Neo Grec. Uh, don't miss the, the grotesque animal mask that's just below the two Nereids. They're kind of tucked away. It's a really amazing piece. At the same time, another historical revival style that gains popularity in the 1880s is the kind of Georgian colonial revival. Um, these are both pieces from 18, sets from 1884. The one at the top uh, above is a special set, as it says there in the photograph. Um, and, uh, but they're clearly looking at 18th, late 18th and early 19th century models very closely. And they actually had some pieces of early American silver in a collection of historical silver that Gorham had formed. And some of these were illustrated in John Buck's book, Old Plate, which Gorham published in 1888. And that was the earliest publication to include images of early American silver, as well as a chronological list of American American plate with makers' names. So Gorham was right at the forefront of the colonial revival. Um, as we've already heard, um, the uh, major event in the 1890s was the arrival in 1891 of William Christmas Codman, another British subject who came to uh, Gorham. Um, he, had, he was born in Norwich and had trained as an ecclesiastical designer, and he worked for uh, the architect George Gilbert Scott, who was one of the great British architects in the sort of historical revival style. And then uh, Codman also subsequently worked for Elkington and Company. So again, thoroughly familiar with what was happening in Britain. And his first designs at Gorham were for objects for the World's Columbian Exposition in 1893, where, which is, was, as I think most of you know, the kind of culmination of that Beaux-Arts historicist uh, trend in American art, where it was the white classical city built in Chicago um, that was, again, this synthesis of all of these different classical elements and historical elements. And one of the most commented on uh, objects in Gorham's exhibition was this uh, Nautilus centerpiece um, that Codman designed um, with its uh, shell and jeweled strap work mounts that are inspired by uh, the mounted cups made in the late 16th and early 17th century in Europe as part of that Renaissance Kunstkammer moment. Um, and the art amateur praised uh, Gorham's exhibition as thoroughly artistic and extolled the fine prize cup made of a nautilus shell is set in the Renaissance manner with figures, shells, and other ornament of gold and precious stones. What's interesting to me about this piece is also the kind of exaggerated contrapposto pose of Venus and her swirling draperies, which also to me, hint at a knowledge of European Art Nouveau or Jugendstil design, um, particularly if you think back to the more staid kind of classical figures that we saw, say, 25 years earlier. And of course, Codman's great um, achievement at Gorham was, uh, together with Holbrook, was in initiating the Martelet line, which they began working on in 1896. Um, and this was uh, very much um, part and parcel of Ruskin and Morris's arts and crafts philosophy. The idea was that the designer and the silversmith making the object would work together rather than the designer being off in the design department and the craftsman figuring out how to do it. There was this kind of enlightened policy of having them work together. Um, and I hope some of you noticed, um, speaking of Ruskin and Morris, uh, Elizabeth showed the picture of the woman putting the varnish on the silver resist uh, piece, and there was a portrait of John Ruskin looking at her uh, from the wall. So they were very aware of John Ruskin at, at Gorham. Um, 
Anyway, um, and these, it certainly uh, can be said that Martelet, um was uh, America's greatest expression of the Art Nouveau style in silver. Um, you can see how these, again, these sinuous lines, this is a, a flagon or a tankard form where the any straight lines have been eliminated and the piece is just this wonderful um, swirling uh, exercise in, 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 in these graceful kind of whiplash lines that were a, a hallmark of that uh, style. And uh, in the essay that Gorham published, in the book that Gorham published uh, to accompany the ex exhibition at the 1900 Paris exhibition, Horace Townsend wrote, the work they produce should be of its own century. Beautiful as is the work of the little masters of the past, it yet speaks in a dead and forgotten tongue. The designer of today, if he is a true artist, must create and not copy. And certainly, um, they were looking. They were very much in the the um, vanguard of of the Art Nouveau style. And I think we can all think of uh, work by um, designers like McMurdo and Ashby in England, or um, Wolfers and Vandeveld in uh, continental Europe that are, have the same quality uh, to their design. And of course, because of the design library, which featured publications like this one or the International Studio, um, again, the designers and the craftsmen would have been very aware of um, what was happening. Now, some Martelet objects, whereas the, the flagon was something that I think is completely new and original, um, as Scott Brasnell has shown, um, some of the Martelet objects were very much situated uh, in historical models. Um, this uh, ewer and basin, there's one similar to it in the, in the exhibition, um, were based on Dutch Mannerist silver of the late 16th and early 17th century, both the form of the ewer and basin and the kind of marine motifs that you see, but reconsidered and reformulated in this um, Art Nouveau style. You could probably argue that Martelet was Gorm's most influential um, uh, line in, uh, of silver uh, in terms of its impact on other American manufacturers. Um, and again, Scott Brasnell has traced this um, certainly in the career of Christopher Whalen, who was a chaser, um, probably responsible for the cream and sugar set that was made by the Barber Silver Company in Connecticut about 1905. And I'm also showing you a tankard made at Reed and Barton in 1905 that similarly um, follows the Martelet style, uh, certainly, uh, I would say the Barber pieces are a little closer. The Reed and Barton piece is a more staid kind of statement of the same idea of uh, naturalistic uh, ornament being uh, gathered along these, these lines. The interesting thing about Reed and Barton is they actually did a, uh, like, like Martelet itself, which was 95% silver, Reed and Barton actually made a limited line of objects that were also 950 standard. This is not to say, however, that just like the Japanese style, as Martelet was going, um, they did not abandon historical style objects at, at Gorham. And um, this tankard, which is in the exhibition on the left, is a great example of this close looking at um, Renaissance examples, one of which you see on the right, um, a German, uh, early 17th century German example that was in the collection of J.P. Morgan. So the plutocrats were both buying the real thing and also buying things made in America um, in the style of, um, which I think is a kind of fascinating um, attempt to, to uh, if you can't get the real thing, you're gonna do the next best thing and get one that looks just like it. Um, these are objects that are less synthetic in the ways that um, Heller's design sort of combined lots of different uh, historical moments and were a little more um, rigorous in, in following the designs of the uh, past objects. John Holbrook, um, who was the son of Edward Holbrook, criticized eclectic design and said, the time has gone by for a hodgepodge and potpourri of all the arts playing discord. Our tendency today is to isolation, selection, and purification of all historical styles. <laughs> 
And what we might see is the culmination of, of this phase of, of Codman's design uh, directorship at Gorham was the 129-piece dinner service made between 1909 and 1911 for Senator William Clark of Montana, um, which was described as being in the Louis XIV style. Um, it's not really copied from a specific piece of 17th century French silver, but all of the elements of it are things that you would have found in uh, 17th century French silver or architecture. Um, and it was designed, essentially, it's the idea of isolation, selection, and purification writ large. Um, and Codman's uh, son, who was also named William, uh, wrote a book on style in silver and commented that the service for Senator Clark is considered the best example of this period in silver ex executed in modern times. Monumental, stately, may we say regal. Codman retired in 1914, and his son William succeeded him. And that really was the end of the Gilded Age at Gorham. And simpler designs, like the Plymouth pattern, which was introduced about 1906, not only were they less expensive to produce, but they also appealed to consumers more in the, is the style shifted from the ornate of the late Victorian period into the uh, early 20th century, and of course this is the apogee of the moment of the colonial, colonial revival. Um, and John Holbrook actually stated in 1918, in the revival of taste today, the demand for colonial examples and colonial representation, reproductions is one of the most hopeful signs we see, in my opinion, for the development of a sincere, pure, and true style of American art. You've already met Eric Magnuson, I've now learned is how you pronounce his name. Um, and he was hired as a kind of special designer. Um, so he seems to have worked independently of William Codman the Younger. Um, he was trained, of course, in Copenhagen and had worked in both Denmark and Berlin before he came here. Um, and his grounding in Danish silver uh, of the first two decades of the 20th century is pretty clear when you look at this wonderful pair of candlesticks uh, with their uh, fluted shafts, the curved sides, the use of colored stones, and the su subtly hammered surfaces. They're very similar to contemporary work made by George Jensen, like this uh, candlestick on the left with the same kind of raised base with open work. Um, and the same kind of design elements present. And Jules Stern has, has made a point, which I think is, is, is an interesting one to think about, that Magnuson may have been chosen to bring modernity to Gorham because the Jensen style was an easier modern pill for American consumers to swallow than, say, something like this, which we've already seen, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. Uh, it's a fabulous thing. They had actually intended the cubic line to go into production, um, but it proved not only too expensive, but was a critical disaster um, when it was exhibited. Um, so instead, Magnuson designed the modern American line, um, radically simpler, much less expensive to produce, um, and unfortunately also not successful. Um, although it was introduced in 1927, which was not, I'm sorry, 1928, which was not the best year to begin introducing a line as it only had about a year and a half before the uh, bottom of the silver market essentially fell out. Um, and in the 30s, um, Gorham makes a few ventures into French art moderne style silver, uh, the Franconia pattern that you see on the left, um, and a very late example of Martelet. It's actually got a Martelet number on it um, in this kind of deco style, still with the hammered, hammered surface and, and ruffled base. Um, but it was the colonial revival that dominated um, the bulk of the production in the during the Depression and the, the World War II, to the extent that production continued. Um, and it's only with William Codman's retirement, the Younger's retirement in 1938, that we feel that it was possible for Gorham to get b into more modern style objects. Um, and uh, Scott Brasnell has attributed this 
uh, cocktail set uh, that Gorham exhibited at the 1939 New York World's Fair as the work of Albert Feinauer, who was another immigrant uh, designer and silversmith, German born and trained, who began working at Gorham in 1934. It's interesting that Gorham had been uh, so burned by the modern style that their, their, their modern pieces I hate to say this in, in this room, but um, Tiffany and company far outshow them in 1939 um, with the designs of Albert Barney and the, the House of Jewels. After the um, World War II, however, there was a new generation of designers at Gorham um, who embraced the biomorphic organic design that had been gestating since the, the 1940s. And you can see how these fluid um, and sort of undecorated shapes, um, there, were, there were the lines trend and directional, um, as well as modern and electroplate, and this is a vegetable dish from the, the modern line, um, take inspiration from many different sources, biomorphic sources that were popular at the time, including Ava Zeisel's um, ceramics or Tommy Parzinger's metalwares. The most inspired interpretation of biomorphism at Gorham was the Circa 70 Hollowware line um, that was designed in 1958 by Donald Colflesh. Um, he'd been hired straight out of the Pratt Institute in New York in 1956, um, and he'd studied with Fred Miller at the Cleveland Institute of Art. And this wonderful set, an example of which is in the, in the exhibition, is really a great uh, statement of the, both the space age and this kind of wonderful up, upward thrusting uh, design, but also in looking at biomorphic um, models like Henning Koppel's famous jug for George Jensen, which clearly was, was an inspiration. And um, another inspiration, of course, was, was Fred Miller, who Colflesh had worked with. And you see a, a bowl from the Circa 70 li line uh, at the upper left, and then a bowl by Fred Miller of 1955 uh, on the lower right. And Miller pioneered this, this technique of stretching metal, as he called it, to create these biomorphic uh, firms. And unintentionally, um, if perhaps fittingly, Circa 70 was the last contemporary hollowware line that was made at Gorham. So bringing to an end an amazing century of design and innovation. Thank you. <laughs>